It is really my pleasure first to say welcome. Uh, we've been doing this series of lunch talks for uh, some time now, and it's always great to come out into the community. I, I have been one who has argued that uh, a college or university like the University of Evansville represents such a collection of talent, of intellectual capital, of programmatic uh, diversity, that we need to share that with the community when we can. And this, this uh, series of talks is designed to do precisely that. So thank you for coming today. And do keep your eye out for future Think Outside the Lunchbox talks, because we, we're, we're very committed to this series, and we'd love to have you attend other talks in the future. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, our chaplain, uh, the Reverend Dr. Uh, Tamara K. Gizelman. She has been the University of Evansville chaplain since 2009. She earned a Doctor of Ministry in Preaching from Chicago Theological Seminary and a Master of Divinity with Honors from Vanderbilt Divinity School. She received a Bachelor of Arts degree from UE in 1995. Tammy is an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. We are, of course, a Methodist affiliated institution. During her 17 years serving in the local church prior to UE, she provided le leadership in the areas of preaching and worship, long range vision, stewardship and personal finance, and practical theology. She serves on the board of advisors and is a consultant and preaching coach for the Academy of Preachers. Tomorrow, in fact, begins the annual UE Pipes and Prophets Festival of Young Preachers and will include 17 young preachers between the ages of 16 and 28. Tammy's interests include preaching, worship, ritual, practical theology, and uh, a point of, of, of recent emphasis, and we're really very proud of and thrilled about, and that is interfaith dialogue. Tammy has led and participated in a variety of international study tours, including trips to Israel, Rome, Russia, and England. During the academic year, Tammy is the primary preacher on Sunday mornings in UE's new chapel. She also teaches in the classroom, <coughs> works with students one-on-one, -on -one, offers small group gatherings on special topics, and organizes religion forums for the campus and community. She has organized a visit to our community by a very special guest and will make the proper introduction. But on behalf of the University of Evansville and the community, please join us in a warm welcome for the Reverend Doctor, the Lord Leslie Griffiths. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kazee. Uh, my thanks also to Lucy Hempstead. As you may well know, this event is typically on the first Tuesday of the month, but we adjusted that knowing that uh, Dr. Griffiths would be here on this week. So my thanks to Lucy as well. <clears throat> Reverend Dr. The Lord Leslie Griffiths of Pembrebury Court is the Superintendent Minister of Wesley's Chapel, the Cathedral of World Methodism in London, England, and a member of the House of Lords Labor Party, receiving a life peerage in 2004. As a regular columnist and BBC broadcaster, Dr. Griffiths has spoken extensively on various educational and social subjects including euthanasia, the church and civic society, the relationship between Christianity and other faiths, and international affairs, including the complex world of international finance. His interests, though not exhaustive, include higher ed, religion and public policy, interfaith relations, preaching, proper care of creation, broadcasting, and ecumenical relations. He has served as president of the Methodist Conference in Britain and as chair of the College of Preachers. Dr. Griffiths became a local preacher in the Methodist Church of Great Britain in 1963, the year I was born, <laughs> and completed a Master of Arts in Theology at Fitzwilliam College in Cambridge in 1969. He studied at Wesley House Cambridge in preparation for ordained ministry. And in 1987, Dr. Griffiths earned a PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Dr. Griffiths has written numerous books on religious and historical themes, including a commissioned work, Voices from the Desert, at the request of recently retired Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. 
His riveting and transparent autobiography, A View from the Edge, has recently been published. In it, Dr. Griffiths writes profoundly and honestly about Christianity. I quote, if the church can tune in to the questions people are really bothered by, it can still play an important part in forming the conscience of our present generation. He provides an illustrious autobiography of adventure, poverty, tragedy, and triumph. And I quote, during my last year at Wesley House, an officer of the Methodist Missionary Society came to challenge us to consider working overseas. In no time at all, we were signed up for this new enterprise. At first, the talk was of Hong Kong, and we began to prepare ourselves for this. Suddenly and out of the blue, we learned that we were not going to Hong Kong after all. A key member of the small ministerial team in Haiti had died unexpectedly. Because I had reasonable French, they decided to send me in his place. This was a shock to the system. But I was now under discipline as a Methodist minister and Margaret, his wife, and I agreed to this change without hesitation. The 60s came to an end and in a state of shock, Margaret and I came out of the meeting where we were told that we'd be going to Haiti. We walked home in silence. We brought out our atlas and turned its pages. <laughs> we prepared for this great adventure. The first thing we needed to do was to find out exactly where Haiti was. <coughs> Dr. Griffiths critiques theologically the religious community he has experienced through the lens of the humanities when he writes, again and again, in music and art, poetry and prose, I found people wrestling with what it means to really be human in today's world. When the musical hair <coughs> took to the stage, church leaders were incensed because this production showed naked people on stage. They'd obviously never been to the UE theater. <laughs> Their fulminations seemed to me to prevent them from hearing the questions that all of us, within and beyond the fold of formal religion, are surely wrestling with. Where do I go? Follow the river. Where do I go? Follow the gulls. Where is the something? Where is the someone that tells me why I live and die? What could be more haunting than that, Griffiths writes. And finally, we learn of his invitation to Parliament in his book. In 2004, Hillary Armstrong, Tony Blair's chief whip, made an appointment to see me. Tony wants you in the Lords, she said. Words that came like a thunderbolt from a clear blue sky. I felt my jaw continuing to make pleasant conversation while my head went into a complete spin. But politics was far too important to leave to politicians. I jumped at the chance, accepted the whip, and have never regretted it since. Please extend a warm welcome to the Reverend Dr. The Lord Leslie Griffiths. Well, um, perhaps before Tammy dreams up her first fiendish question, <laughs> because I know she's been up since three o'clock this morning <laughs> devising a series of elephant traps for me. Um, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be here. Um, all those titles are a bit unnerving, aren't they? Um, I, I, we live in an egalitarian church in, uh, in, in England, and uh, when I'm invited, they say, Dear Leslie, will you come and preach at our special service? And I say, Dear Fred, of course I will. And of course they want me to understand that no airs and graces are required between fellow Methodists. It's just that a month before I'm due to go there, I get the inevitable follow-up letter 
that says, we've looked at all your titles. What order do we put them in? <laughs> because at the end of the day, they like them rather more than I do. So um, I think that Leslie Griffiths is quite good enough for me. And since I'm a Methodist minister, um, when in, in, in my discipline and my life, there is only one Lord, <coughs> and it isn't me. So here I am, um, and delighted to be at Evansville uh, University. Uh, we had this ebullient um, Tammy Gieselman and her students um, last year. I mean, um, I don't know how much you resemble the Vicar of Dibley, <laughs> but you do, definitely. And if that's a mystery to those who have heard me say it, just look it up and see what I mean. A lot of situation comedies with this fantastically lively priest of the Church of England who gets herself into all kinds of scrapes and usually gets out of them too. So, there we are. Um, I'm delighted to be here and to share some thinking with you uh, now, and uh, I, I'm just going on talking for as long as I can, because I have a bit of a suspicion that the questions that are to follow will be fiendishly difficult. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. And, and we would like to offer a point of privilege if you have a burning question in the midst of this process. Uh, I think we would like for you to extend a hand so that we can uh, interact with you during this time. So feel free. Uh, well, let's start uh, with uh, sort of setting the stage. Uh, since we were in the UK last summer, Dr. Griffiths, uh, Her Majesty the Queen's Jubilee year has ended. President Obama is just beginning his second term. Haiti is still digging out from under the devastating earthquake of three years ago. Uh, there is nuclear threat from both Iran and more recently North Korea again. World peace seems like a foolish pipe dream. Pope Benedict's addiction, now Prime Minister David Cameron has indicated the possibility that the UK will separate from the European Union. So from your perspective and based on these sort of highlights, uh, could you assess the global climate today? Um, as a global society, is there hope for a bright future? Well, all men are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. I think that's where we've got to start. Um, the, theologian, the theologians in New York, the Nirbo brothers and others, um, at the end of the 1930s were reminding us in an age when fascism and totalitarianism was on the rise and the world was suffering from an economic depression um, that um, for, theo for, for theologians, for people in the church, to slip away into some kind of comfort zone simply was not enough. And uh, I guess that um, as long as the committed continue to have a wide vista and a readiness to get involved in uh, making for good community relations, um, healing wounds where they find them, uh, um, espousing causes that are the right causes, um, and refuse to be dragged down into the perpetual round of women bishops, homosexuals, and all the stuff that surely everybody's bored to death with because everything has been said, and if we can just keep alive the vision of a world in which all its children, all its people, because they're all made in the image of God, have some place in the sun, uh, can be able to grow to their full maturity, then there will be hope. But boy, the ifs are fantastic. They truly are. Now, in London, where I am, these are not just academic matters. Um, they're not academic matters at all. Uh, John Wesley, who built the chapel that I, um, I, I'm the senior pastor of, um, he said famously that he looked upon the whole world as his parish. Well, that was to escape um, the, the limiting disciplines of sticking to one place. He wanted to go everywhere. But now, the whole world has taken John Wesley at his word, and they've come to live in his parish. We have a congregation at Wesley's Chapel. We put the flags up for the Olympic Games for every nation represented in our congregation, 55. There were 27 languages other than English as a mother tongue for the people of our congregation. We have people um, who have lived and worked and somehow survived the genocide in Rwanda. 
we have people married to Jews in, and, 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 and Muslims in interfaith marriages. We have um, Roman Catholic Protestant marriages with the problems that sometimes flow even from that. Uh, we've, um, uh, we commission um, some of our young men for service in the armed forces in Afghanistan. And just a year ago, had the terribly sad news of one of them being killed and uh, we were just all crying our eyes out on that Sunday morning where we remembered that the young man we had commissioned three months previously was now dead. So they're not notional ideas, this big world in turmoil. We're very close to it. My colleague Jennifer is chair of the inner borough um, interfaith communities and one of the Muslim places of worship, a mosque, um, was very famous for a hook-handed imam um, who used to preach terror on the streets of London. It's now a much more peaceful thing and the imam has been um, uh, put into prison. Um, but it's, it's a tinderbox. And yet it's a fantastic thing to be living cheek by jowl. We're just round the corner from Tottenham where a year before the Olympic Games there were street riots and properties on fire, inner city discontent young people feeling alienated from the processes that we take for granted. So what I'm trying to say really is that, that this kind of a, a world in turmoil that you're hinting at is a world that, that comes through our doors. It's part of the reality we work with. I have great opportunities, we have great opportunities. Jennifer with the interfaith uh, community, um, I'm in Parliament and I'm able to, um, to get alongside human rights groups um, to work in the field of uh, healing historic rifts <coughs> Um, are getting power brokers to, um, to look again at some of the problems that we've rather left for, you know, left cold for a long time. And it's, I just feel that the, the, the opportunities are terrific. But at the end of the day, and I've just reached the end of my long answer with this, at the end of the day, if you introduce a new system or a new measure or a new law and haven't first of all establish the need for that law in the hearts and minds of the people who are going to be governed by it then it's useless if people don't say at last this gives us a framework within which we can breathe at last this gives us a, a platform from which we can build a different kind of society if they don't take the measures that are produced in that sort of way then the politicians can rave and rant for all they're worth and the church leaders can preach their sermons for all they're worth and moralizing and the rest of it can do its work but no good is done so we have a great opportunity where I am um, first of all to be sensitive to the needs of the world and secondly to work at people not only in terms of of the systemic responses to their problems um, or the administrative um, problems like if they're homeless or if they're without benefits or whatever, or about to be deported. I mean, these are daily occurrences. Um, but also to try and create opportunities to, to introduce measures that will be an adequate response that everybody can feel comfortable with. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a bewildering world. <coughs> I don't think sometimes that we realize how close we are to, to the edge. But there are possibilities, and it is worth the candle. And yes, um, as Tammy says, um, don't let me launch into one of my long answers, because I can do them forever, you know. Um, but just shove your hand up. And I know that, um, you know, you're in awe because uh, you're hearing English spoken properly for a change. <laughs> <coughs> um, but don't, don't, don't let that sort of uh, rule the roost. Just say, come on, preacher, just, uh, just shut up for a minute and let me talk, or, or whatever way you like to say it, because I know you, you're very rough and ready out these parts. So please, do let's have it interactive if that's the way you want it. Oh, there we are, straight away. You talked about this world as being a tinderbox and being on the edge, etc. You have multiple roles. Um, what do you think is the role of the church in this sometimes frightening world in which we live. If only the church could understand the opportunities available to it, then the role is very considerable indeed. I believe that, um, that the church ought to be, uh, I'm qualifying all my sentences, ought to be um, the body 
because it brings together such diverse human types. What other society brings together people from economic uh, brackets that are so different, educational backgrounds that are so different, ages that are so different, than the church? The church really has the raw material out of which to make an army that can go to war on these issues. Um, but too often, um, either we are raising the last slice of money to pay for the bell tower, and that's our agenda, or um, we, um, we content ourselves with, um, with a little bit of altruism to salve our conscience, um, or um, we um, allow the agenda to be shaped by the secular voices around us, and we do ourselves no service by, by, by the obsessive way that we just um, deal with uh, sexual orientation, uh, anything to do with sex, actually. I mean, I mean, I think that the church has never got itself sorted out since the age of St. Augustine on the question of sex. Um, and, and there are bigger themes. I mean, let me just say that I'll walk with people who have different views from mine on the question of sexual orientation, but let's agree to walk together towards the bigger front line of the battles that have actually to be fought if the world's to be made a better place. What good does it do the church if the newspapers are full all the time with the, the preoccupation with these, these, these rather tawdry matters? When there are people, and you know, your country in particular, where the church still has some strength. I know that even here um, things aren't as they used to be, but compared with other places, I mean, come to England and see what, where the church is. I mean, really and seriously, we're in a mess. But for me, it's the opportunity to gather up our forces again and to remind ourselves of our prime task, which is to give a reasonable explanation of the claims of the Christian faith, not to, to, to retreat into, into this goody-goody language and this um, sort of uh, you know, happy, clappy list. You know, you've got this American football, which isn't football, I'm not sure it's... <laughs> <laughs> I think um, our time here is uh, over. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they, go into, they go into this huddle. They go into this huddle. The church goes into a huddle, and everything it deals with happens in that huddle. Well, now, unless that ball comes out and there's a tactical play and there's a good throw to the quarterback and, uh, from the quarterback and there's someone running in the right place and you can find him and so on, unless all that happens, the huddle's for nothing. Often the church just stays in the huddle, and it, it finds nicer and softer music uh, to make itself feel good and all the rest of it. And there's big questions out there. So I think the, I think the church, I mean, I, I just want to issue a rallying call to the church. I see three or four hundred people every Sunday in church in front of me. And I see them from all these 55 nations. I just know that if we could galvanize ourselves, we could go out there into the inner city borough, down into the city of London, where all the high finance of Britain is sorted out. We could ask questions about regulation of the financial sector. We could ask questions about um, uh, how you support people who are really poor, how you can avoid creating a society where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Because at the end of the day, whatever your views, whatever party you vote for, it isn't right that a few should get richer and richer and the rest should get poorer and poorer. It just isn't right. I'm sure it isn't how God sees things. Now, if we can get ourselves sort of excited around that sort of an agenda, why? Anything could happen. Anything could happen. I mean, I, I'm a Welshman. A hundred years ago, just over a hundred years ago, there was a revival in Wales. Um, Evan Roberts, his name was, and it's, I mean, it created the waves that became Pentecostalism across the world. And it started in a little village in my part of Wales, about 10 miles from where I grew up. And that revival was widely acknowledged um, by magistrates, the police, and all the rest of it for the next 10 or 15 years to have cut the crime rates, to have improved the social conscience, to have created community awareness in a way that nothing else had. Unfortunately, it then atrophied, it ironed out, and its initial fervor was lost. But one has seen it happen. Why can't? Look at John Wesley himself. I mean, an amazing man. Um, Wesley's Chapel is, was built in 1778, about the time as America was invented. Um, <laughs> and um, for 40 years before that, um, John Wesley had operated the time of greatest fervor in a rented premises, a disused <coughs> foundry that had blown up and he hastily repaired. And what did he do in this ramshackle provisional place? 
He started an educational system. He started a health system for the poor. Um, he uh, housed the destitute. He had a ministry for people on death row and campaigned for the abolition of the death penalty. That's in 17 whatever. Um, and, um, and he had a microfinance project to help people found businesses or deal with their financial problems. John Wesley, we think of him in pietistic terms now, a preacher, a holy man. And Charles writing those wonderful hymns. But actually, he wanted, and um, I'm very friendly with a Labour politician called Roy Hattersley, who has written a biography of John Wesley. Now, he hasn't got a clue about John Wesley's doctrine, and he's all wrong. The book is lousy. <laughs> but <coughs> it's a terrific book in assessing the importance of John Wesley, not for the 18th century when he was alive, but for the 19th century when the whole of British society assumed a shape, uh, it assumed characteristics that were almost surely the product of the Methodist revival of a hundred years later. And, and that's absolutely spot on. So things can happen, things have happened. Where's our faith? Where's our excitement? Where's our sense of the chase? That's what I want to know. So, there you are. You see what I mean about long answers. <laughs> you just got to stick your hand up. Yes, sir. Well, uh, much of what you just said has to do, do with uh, social action. So, the little church that I grew up in, in uh, northern Michigan, their, their first order of business was to get people saved uh, uh, so that they could go to heaven. And I, it seems to me that uh, they're in lies a bit of a problem uh, if that's the main goal of the church is to save people for Jesus Christ and here we are up against uh, all these um, Muslims and other people of other religions <coughs> well I'm quite happy to leave the intractable problems at the end of the day when my wit runs out to the Almighty himself because he's got answers that I can't even guess at so um, I'm happy to do my bit and to be quite agnostic about uh, what lies beyond my wit and my ability. Um, but you're, you're, you're quite right that, um, that uh, um, the other side of the equation, and we must find a way to do this too, is how to reclaim our theological and spiritual agenda. People ask me, I used to, I didn't grow up as a Methodist, I grew up in a, in a godless home, well, it isn't quite true, but in a, in a home where church going and religion figured in no way at all. Indeed, my mother, my dear old mother, who raised two boys um, herself in one room after her husband threw her and us out of the house with one week's notice in the hardest winter of post-Second World War times, um, my mother um, used to say, why should I go to, to church? I mean, she said, uh, I smoke, I like my cigarettes, um, I like a little glass of, um, of something now and again. Um, I put a little money on a horse for the big races, not all the time, for the big races. <coughs> um, I do the football coupons, I do the, 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 uh, the, the, the treble chance and, uh, and the three draws, those were <laughs> particular lines. I used to go and post it for her every week. Um, and, and she said, um, and what's, uh, what's, I love my bingo, um, you know, which, which the chapels of, of Burryport where I grew up were ranting about, about the evil as the devil's in there. She said, I love it, and I'm divorced, she said. So, I mean, you know, I'm not going to give all those preachers, you know, subjects to preach about. So I'll, <laughs> I'll stay home, she said. Um, and and that's, that's it. We become moralistic. But at the same time, there is... Uh, so I... And I, I know I, I won't bore you with all the steps that brought me A to faith and B to feel called to be a minister. But um, I had to find it out for myself. I had to take a step at a time. I had to feel it was right for me to take the next step. I was determined not to be swept along by euphoria or, 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 or special pleading or influence. I needed to f see the next step. One step enough for me, said John Henry Newman, uh, as he looked at the way ahead, and that was it for me. And, and, and I got there. So when people ask me now, so why are you a Methodist? I said, because Methodism, when it's properly in practice, has this positively inebriating relationship between personal faith and social action. And too often the social action is done divorced from personal faith, and those doing it get more and more tired because the problems are big, the mountains are high, and uh, some do the, the saving souls bit without any social expression for that. And so, once again, it, it sort of um, it, it goes in on itself. 
to me, the one feeds the other. The reciprocity is fantastic. We've just done, last Sunday, wasn't it, the, um, the transfiguration. And the transfiguration for me is terrific. Jesus takes the three people up the top of the mountain. They have this fantastic moment of ecstasy. They come down, there's a poor boy suffering from his epilepsy, and they, they just can't do anything about it. What's the point of having a mountaintop experience if it doesn't turn you into agents for improving the lot of people like that? Then the other nine, who didn't go up at all, who were left with the problems, they didn't seem to have the oomph and the energy to do it, or the wit or the imagination, I don't know what, but they weren't doing it. So all 12 of them were faced by this problem that they couldn't solve. Jesus was as much at home in the mountaintop experience as in the valley bottom experience. Now that's the model for us to cultivate the spiritual, to deepen our sense of, of God's desire to have humanity reconciled with himself on the same level as himself, wanting the same things as himself, and all that he's done to make that possible um, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, those who know that they are loved, those who know that, um, that, that God has a plan for his world, can't sit with that treasure, treasure and bury it like the man who buried the treasure in the corner of the field. They've got to go out there and do something about it. Now, that's the message that I try to preach week by week. And I have to say, look at me. I jump out of bed in the morning. I'm well past retirement age. I still want to do the job. Whilst I've got breath, I just want to get on with it and do what I can. I mean, aren't I the lucky one? Ah, oh, now we have a professor of political science with his hand. <laughs> <coughs> you anticipated my question. <laughs> <laughs> what are, one of the roles that you're playing is in, in the House of Lords. Mm. And uh, I think there's a degree of discouragement in the United States about the direction the political process has taken, especially the, the evidence of uh, polarization of life that which we've seen for a long time and the difficulties that creates for reaching public. Um, in, 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 in Britain, is, is there a similar uh, polarizing force? How have you and your colleagues in Parliament dealt with the challenges of finding common ground in an environment that seems in, increasingly strident? Well, it, it is, it's not the same problem as you have um, with this extraordinary phenomenon of um, of, of, of two blocks of people who don't seem to be able to say a good thing about each other. Um, I shall never forget being in Chicago um, the day after or the week after the inauguration the first time of President Obama and listening, listening to this, um, well I don't know how you produce such people or allow them airtime, but a man called Ross Lindbergh, is it? <laughs> um, and and uh, uh, you know the President had just swore, sworn his oath he hadn't yet done anything. It was his first term. And this man is slagging him off on the radio and getting huge newspaper headlines agreeing with him. Well, I mean, if the president and his administration um, get through Congress uh, initiatives that, show, uh, that prove to be wrong, by all means, be critical. But when you haven't done anything, and when the people have spoken, what is democracy if it isn't accepting the one, I mean, take your bat home and your ball home when, uh, when, when you don't get the results you want. Listen, I lived through the 1980s in England. I hated Margaret Thatcher. Hated her policies, I mean. Lovely girl. Don't get me wrong. Um, lovely Methodist girl. And, um, and we get on all right. But boy, the monetarism, uh, the tight fiscal uh, policies, the, um, I, I hated it. But you knew that that's what the people had voted for then, and that's what you had to live with then. Make the best of it. You Republicans, it's not your turn. I mean, fight for the next election to make that your turn. But for the moment, it's not your turn. Get on with it. Build your country. Develop your systems. Do something to make things better for all Americans, not just for those who think the way that you do. Now, we don't have that problem in Britain. Not like that. Not like that. Um, but we have, um, we have since uh, Margaret Thatcher actually um, uh, developed this neoliberalism, um, uh, this uh, approach to economics that uh, Tony Blair was very fond of, a deregulated market, um, um, sort of uh, um, uh, uh, low taxes, uh, incentives to people to come and work and so on, uh, which created the greed, the short-termism, 
and all of that. That um, I mean, it, it was Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair and even Gordon Brown, his successor. And the, the Labour Party now are sort of asking themselves fundamental questions about how to how to how to soften that. Um, but we have this coalition government. We have government by people who are rich at the minute. Um, David Cameron went to the most expensive uh, high school and then to Oxford afterwards. Um, um, and so did um, um, his Chancellor of the Exchequer and so did the Mayor of London and, and, and now even the Archbishop of Canterbury went to the same wretched school. Um, <laughs> so you just, and, and, and they all come into politics now um, via the route of public relations or by becoming political <coughs> advisors. So they haven't actually lived in the real world. Two days ago, um, it's Thursday, isn't it? It is. Tuesday. Um, um, I um, led um, um, a memorial event for one of the great um, legal officers of the British Parliament. He died some time ago, and, um, and, and, and so we had all our Supreme Court, and we had all, um, all the people in the law, but we also had parliamentarians and so on. And Peter, whom we were remembering, Peter, in 1945, was, was conscripted by the British government in times of war. Um, he was too young to go into the forces. They sent him down the coal mines. And for three years, this boy with a budding future became a coal miner. Whilst he was a coal miner, he studied in every hour God gave and got a degree, two degrees in law from the University of London, eventually became the top legal officer of the British Parliament. And everybody on all sides of the equation said, his word was his bond, you knew where you stood with him, there was no side, there was no scheming, um, goodness was rehabilitated, decency, loyalty and the rest of it. And I made the point really that Peter just stands like a beacon for the politics of our day. Um, and somehow when you come up those hard routes, now that everybody goes to university, because everybody has a chance to get there quick, because they can get in to somebody's office and find one thing leading to another, but um, I just regret that our politics is too often um, not in the hands of people who've lived on our streets, done our things, had a life, um, earning a living and paying their taxes and so on, but they, they become professional politicians younger and younger. The great thing about the House of Lords is that um, um, I know that it's a, it's a, it's a curious thing for, I, you know, when I'm depressed, which isn't often, um, um, I go, I take the car and I go down to the House of Lords and, you know, you go through the door and when you've been addressed as my Lord 20 times in about a minute, you feel better. It's, <laughs> <coughs> it's, um, it's better, better than paracetamol. Um, so, so um, but it's a curious <coughs> thing the House of Lords because it's not an elected chamber and that's I know a difficult one for Americans to understand but let me just try and explain something on the other side of that first of all it's the elected chamber that does all the determinative work if there's a quarrel between the two houses the elected chamber always wins there's a Parliament Act of 1911 that ensures that in in the event of, of, a, of, of a dispute that can't be solved between the two houses then the House of Lords withdraws graciously and allows the Commons to. So it is the people who have the last word always. But you'd be surprised at the mess the representatives in the House of Commons make of the legislation. They put sh so much legislation before <laughs> themselves, they put a guillotine on, and you have complicated, like we had a health bill. Um, wait, 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 it, was, it was about 550 pages. Um, and um, they, they put a guillotine on of three days in committee, which meant that they could get about as far as page eight, um, and then put the guillotine on, sent it to the Lords. Because our job is to review and scrutinize. We have lots of lawyers, lots of people with experience in, in, in those sorts of situations, as well as people who know about health. Um, so the House of Lords is a reviewing and a scrutinizing chamber. It, it, it doesn't have the last word. And because it's an appointed chamber, you can actually bring into it people who would never stand for office. So you, you've got your top industrialists, you've got your, you've got your top um, people from the finance sector, you've got people who run banks sitting in the House of Lords, and, and it's a terrific thing to listen to them sometimes. Um, so, uh, and then 
the representativeness of the House of Lords, far higher percentage of women than the House of Commons, um, and women who've held the highest offices in Parliament. Um, I mean, we have a, a Lord Speaker, I'm afraid they haven't changed the title yet, but, um, but, uh, but the Lord Speaker in, in, in the House of Lords is, is a woman, and her predecessor was a woman. The Leader of the House is a woman. Um, many ministers of government are women in the, in the Lords. In the, in the Commons, a tiny proportion of women, and very few of them holding significant office. Um, people of different sexual orientations, people of different faith backgrounds, um, people of different experiences and disciplines and so on. So the Lords is actually a, a, a good thing. So um, there's been all this talk about abolishing the House of Lords um, and uh, introducing an elected chamber instead of an appointed chamber. Well, I think that that would lead us to the same position that you're in. Because um, if it were an elected second chamber, the House of Lords would not be happy to giving precedence to the House of Commons. If we're elected, same as you're elected, why let's sort out our powers and don't tell us what to do if we disagree with you. And that's where it would get to. And if there were a majority for one party in one house and a majority for the other party in the other house, why we'd have exactly your situation. So um, I think that we British should just get used to the fact that this may be a, a blessing in disguise. Of course, what it panders to is the whole notion of privilege and titles, which in Britain we're not brilliant at, I have to say. But um, So I'd take the titles out, actually. Call us senators. That's even better. Why not? Yes, sir. <coughs> I hope I can keep all this straight. This has to do with the marriage bill. Oh, gosh. I knew we'd come to that. Mm. <laughs> worked hard to get it passed through the House of Commons. Um, and it was just uh, Justin Welby, the new Archbishop of Canterbury has taken a position, or at least he said he has taken a position, that is, I guess, with the uh, Church of England, which I know there's a difference. Um, you serve in the House of Lords, you will have an opportunity also to vote on that bill. And to speak on it. And to speak on it. Mm. And so, how do you see the, and I don't even know what the Methodist position is, but how do you see the evolution of the Church of England reconciling to what Well, <coughs> I mean, in order to give you an adequate response, I have to lay out some of the, the innards of this question, um, and I don't think this is the right forum for that. But just to say that um, um, we had an election two years ago, Three political parties produced their manifestos to go to the country, vote for us and this is what we'll do. And not one of them had a same-sex marriages bill in their manifesto. So it's quite legitimate um, for there to be an open debate on this one, which is why when it uh, went through the Commons the other day, the Prime Minister allowed there to be a free vote. So um, at least he, um, he honoured that, but of course it was carried massively although on his own party, the Conservative Party, more people voted against the bill than voted for it. On the Labour side and the Liberal Democratic side, it was massive majorities in favour, so it was carried. It will come to the Lords in about a month's time, um, and uh, we are all sharpening our knives. Um, but it's a curious bill, as far as the Church of England and the Church in Wales are concerned, the Anglicans, because it specifically forbids them to recognize same-sex marriage. Now, this is without arguing whether it is right or wrong. It's a bill that makes it possible uh, for people of the same sex to marry each other. Um, and, um, and um, uh, you know, so, so that's, that's that. But it specifically prohibits the Church of England and the Church in Wales, although it does also say that it's not obligatory for any church to do it until and unless they themselves have voted to be in compliance with the law. So there's no attempt to force churches down that road. So we're left to, to debate the issues, um, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And um, I just find it um, very tricky. I mean, let me say that, uh, you know, the, the question is lost. I mean, uh, there will be same-sex marriages in England within a year. Um, so uh, there's nothing the House of Lords can do to stop that. 
They will try and um, hold things up. They'll put complicated amendments down. They'll make it really difficult for the people at the other end. But at the end of the day, as I said earlier, the Commons will have its will. My position is, is this. Um, I'm very liberal on the question of, of gay relations. It's 50 um, years ago, 1962, that um, 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 homosexual acts were decriminalized. Um, so I remember the time when uh, people were put in jail. Well, so do you here. Um, since then, um, Stonewall and all the rest of it um, have um, started this gay rights movement and so on, um, and, and whipped up public attention, and uh, now it's almost de rigueur that um, a television sitcom has a gay actor in it, um, and all the rest of it. Um, um, and certainly my children, I have three kids in their late 30s, they simply do not understand what the fuss is about or what the issue is. They have gay friends, they go about with their gay friends. My daughter, until she found the young man who was to be her partner, her life partner, um, she loved going out with gay men because she felt safe with them. <laughs> <coughs> um, uh, anyway, so, so, so um, I myself have had to face it um, as a church minister and um, I've looked at it in terms of justice, not um, sexual orientation. I mean, I've heard debate after debate after debate about people where people stand up and tell you what happens between same-sex people, and it's not very edifying at all uh, to conduct a debate in that way, I mean. Um, so um, when I was, uh, in the 1980s, um, minister in West London, I'm in East London now, uh, we um, um, produced a young man who became a candidate for the ministry. And he was a thoroughly good thing. But in the course of his candidature, I mean, I would be proud to have him as, as a colleague any day. Um, and in the course of his candidature, he revealed to me that he was gay. And that he felt he was being put under a lie to go on candidating without telling everybody that. And, um, and so, in the name of honesty, he declared that he was gay. Oh, and it stirred the nest, you know, but now I'm alongside him. I received so many vilifying letters, so much disordered thinking, so many people um, offloading crap um, on me and the young man that had nothing to do with the case, but triggered these responses which people seem to keep inside themselves, and they go foul inside themselves, um, I've never, ever, I never imagined that all that stuff was in, inside the church. I didn't seek it. I didn't set up my stall. This is what I believe. I found this young man who I thought was a top class candidate for the ministry. And I was already committed to him when he told me. Do you think I was going to be less committed now? So I actually presented the first openly gay man for the Methodist ministry in England. Let me tell you that the forces of reaction welled up and he was, as far as I know, the last openly gay man because the doors were shut. Let it be said that there's quite a lot of gay ministers who haven't um, sort of, uh, you know, come out. Um, so that was that. Then, then there was um, a lesbian woman um, who had met all the criteria for being accepted and normally, the Methodist Conference, our annual conference, would nod that person through because she was one of about a dozen who had achieved all the grades, and she was one of them. The conference agreed, agreed, we all say. That's what we say. But somebody objected, singled her out, and took advantage of the fact she was in there to lay before the conference stuff that had been looked at in the committees and all the rest of it of the, of the church. And I brought in an emergency notice of motion on the last day of conference to try and reverse the rejection of that woman. Um, we had to have a 75% majority to do it. We got to 74 or whatever it was. And I had to take on some of the, 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 the most distinguished leaders of the church at that time. So my views have been shaped by the way history put me alongside these two people. It was not something that I thought about theoretically. Sexual ethics are not my thing, but practically and in terms of justice. But because of that, I have come to see that um, I, as a happily married man, 
uh, with, with a marriage that is 43 years old and still going strong. I told her she got to be there when I get back. Um, um, I am the last person to have the right to tell anybody that I deny them the right to have a similarly sustaining and reciprocal arrangement. I of all people. I mean, I just want people to have a sustaining relationship. Um, so um, I've come a step at a time in that way. Now, seven years ago in England, we brought onto the statute book something called the Civil Partnerships Act, which meant that, um, that gay people, same-sex people, could have a civil union recognized by law with all rights and entitlements of people committed to each other guaranteed by that act. I believe that was, the, that, that, that was what the churches missed out on. You see, at the end of the day, what can I do if it's the law of the land? I mean, I'll fight against it if I think it's wrong until it goes on the statute book, but when it's on the statute book, I mean, what then? So, I believe that the church should, we've got in, in Wesley's Chapel congregation about um, six civil partnerships. Um, some have been together for decades. Um, and we've got one marriage between two men, but not done in England and not done with a reference to me. I mean, who came over to Iowa? where the Church of, uh, Church of Christ sort of does it, that's where he's from. So they wanted me to come and do it, and if I'd been able to, I suppose I would have. But can I give young Ken and Michael less pastoral care because they're married than if they weren't? Of course not. Human beings are human beings, whatever they are. Boy, the people I've given pastoral care to, let me tell you, weirdos and all kinds of funny people down the years. And, and these are two fine young men trying to do their bit to make society a better place. So, so we've got them all in front of us. So how do I now form my opinion when I go to Parliament? Well, I just, I wonder where the proposal for same-sex marriage came from. What, I've asked all my gay friends, what extra are you going to get beyond civil partnerships by having a marriage. What, what is there that you don't have now? All right, so you don't have the prayers of the church. I'll fight for the church to give you prayer and a liturgical act. But what else? Do you feel that you're sh being shortchanged? And honestly, all our gay uh, community leaders feel that this has come as much as a surprise to them as to anybody else. So I want to say that marriage is not a word um, that, that, is, that, that is without its own luggage and, and without its own baggage. It brings, it, it, it has content. It, it comes from, um, you know, across the generations. Marriage is not just a word onto which you can simply graft um, another category of people who don't meet some of its inherent stipulations. I wish we had developed the civil partnership. I wish we had surrounded it with prayer. I wish it had become, in a diverse world, part of what we all offer. But it hasn't happened, so now we're in a mess. Now, the church is not often prophetic. It waits to be reactive. And in that way, it allows people to think that it's got it all wrong all along, and it's just prejudice and homophobia all the way down the line. Now, I've got to try and say that when my party will be screaming for all of us to go through the lobbies in favor of the legislation. I shall vote against. I hate to stop abruptly, but we're due back on campus <coughs> to uh, <coughs> When you put me. your first question. <laughs> Why was I here? <coughs> uh, we're due back for a political science class, but Dr. Griffiths will be our Founders Day, our Edgar M. McCown Founders Day speaker on Sunday morning. So if you are not committed to a local church, uh, make plans to come to New Chapel. Uh, he's also speaking tomorrow in Bob Dion's political science class. So there are a couple more opportunities for you. I want to thank you all for coming today, but please join me in a very, uh, again, warm welcome to the Evansville community, to Lord Griffiths, and thank you to Tammy for bringing him to us this week for a lot of opportunities to get a chance to visit with you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.